Rakas made us from stone to protect Gurdogard. Against orcs, ogres, and all the other beasts of Teon. We are the guardians of Gurdogard. We are the children of the Divine Smith. We are the Dwarves. from the workshop.
dead! My king! What are you doing here? Gizelbert I and I, the father of the Fithling clan, has not been on the front line of battle against the creatures of Teon for many cycles. The king surveys the battlefield and the defenders with a grave expression. <sighs> we are too few! <sighs> this you know as well as he does. But there will be no reinforcements arriving. Hundreds of brave warriors lie inside the fortress dying. The illness is running rampant. It brings weakness and death. Stay at your posts! Be as steadfast as the granite of which we are made! Nothing can break us! Vrakas is with us! What is it? Yes? On my way! Yes. On my way! Not yet, boy! 
Impossible! Yes? Ha! All right!
shall be shown. Losses beating them back. Come here and I'll split you like a straw, you treacherous elf! In his fury, the old king radiates a ferocious power that none of Sitalia's children could withstand. But the slight, willowy being sitting astride the shadow mare just grins down, mockingly. You are mistaken. We are Alpha. We are here to destroy the Elves. All peace-loving beings here in Girdlegard are under our protection, and you cannot open the gate that has barred your path into Girdlegard since the creation of the world. Not us, but perhaps one of your This cannot be. Silence, you fool! Vrakas! Forgive me for what I am about to do! <laughs> Quickly! Information! You must hold them back until I close the gate! <laughs> yes?
charge! That's that! Come here, you! Understood! Charge! And stay dead! Look at me. I am Syntharas, the Reaper of your death. I will take your life, and the land will take your soul. Get out of my sight, pointy ears, and let me delight at the closed gate a little longer. The gate may have closed, but when you rise again from the dead by the power of the land, you will be one of us, and you will open it. Never! My soul belongs to Vrakas. No. Your soul now belongs to the land. And henceforth you will belong to it forever. Now die. And return. Then hand us Girdelgard. You're a perfectionist, Tungdale Bolifar. I've got a reputation to uphold. If you can't rely on the metalwork of a dwarf, what can you rely on? What can I do for you? For me, nothing. It's Lot Yonan. He wants to see you in his study. In your mind, you go through all the recent incidents that might have annoyed the Magus. Apart from a few little squabbles with his family, nothing worth mentioning happened since the incident with your beard. You nod. Okay. You look dreadful. What a charmer. The maid gives you an ironic, reprimanding scowl. Ikana has been crying half the night. When you were teething, I carried you around the vaults. You played with my beard and I sang you to sleep. Frala smiles. She's heard this story many times before. That was 23 cycles ago. But I'm quite sure you didn't sing. You might have grumbled a bit. If what you've read about the Dwarven lifespan is true, it'll be another 300 sun cycles and more before you are called to the Eternal Forge. The certainty of one day having to witness Frala's death already burdens your heart. I'd better not keep the Magus waiting. See you later. There's goulash for dinner.
There was a time when you could hardly lift the heavy hammer. Now you barely notice it anymore and it feels like an extension of your arm. Smithing is in your blood. This is where you swung the forge hammer for the first time 30 cycles ago. No one taught you the craft. It was enough for you to watch Lot Yonan's old smith at work. Whenever the workshop was empty, you practiced and quickly mastered the craft with ease. There are apparently dwarves who have never seen the sky. And you too feel more comfortable when you have rock over your head. If only you didn't long to see more of the world, a longing that grows stronger with every year. Everything you know about dwarves you learnt from books. The divine smith created the dwarves and from time to time you make him an offering of some crumbs of gold. It's the most valuable thing you have to offer Vracus. Everything you know about dwarves you learnt from books. You've worked a bit more on Sunya's birthday present last night. The little one is crazy about horses. You, on the other hand, prefer to keep your distance unless you're fitting them with hooves. Too many legs and way too big. You've worked a bit more. Hey, groundling! Come to the kitchen, we need you! Jollison, a fourth degree famulus and your favorite foe among the students of magic, gives you a disparaging glance and disappears without waiting for your reply. Lot Yonan's vaults are equipped with laboratories, a library, and private rooms for the famuli. Together with the forge, the kitchen, and the other utility rooms, it makes up quite an impressive complex. But compared to the courts of the other magi, the seat of power in Yonandar is small and modest. Tongue tail! Quick! Or the golash will get burnt! You immediately recognize what the problem is. A chain running over a pulley for positioning the cauldron is detached from its mounting and the cauldron stuck in the fireplace. It's a heavy load and none of the famuli, who feel superior even during kitchen duty, dare do anything. They might burn their fingers or even get a bit dirty. Vegetables, bread, cheese, but the cook is not to be trifled with. Many painful knuckles have taught you that she knows how to handle her heavy wooden spoon and that she may possibly have eyes in the back of her head. I am your godfather, little one. I'll look after you just like I looked after your mother. Little Akana grasps your calloused finger and smiles at you wide-eyed. The beer that is delivered to the vaults is supposed to be the best beer in Iddersland. It's certainly your favorite beer, but you haven't drunk enough other beers to truly know. I just wanted... The stew, quickly now. I just wanted... The stew... It'd be a waste of goulash. And I'm hungry. Here, 
of this. Do you remember when you dyed my beard with some magic spell? I had to shave it off. You stroke your beard, which is unusually short for a dwarf. Damn it! Ah, oh, it's heavy! The young human forces through his pursed lips, letting the pot sink a little. Don't you dare ruin my goulash, boy! The cook with beefy forearms glares at the young man, and after a brief moment, he tries harder. With as much concern in your voice as you can muster, you say, Oh, no, no, this doesn't look good. You're pleased to notice he's dripping with sweat. <laughs> I'll get you back for this, groundling! You damned freak! For a moment, you hope the Famulus really does raise his hand to you. But then he comes to his senses and leaves the kitchen, his face bright red. What a pair you are! The goulash is bubbling in the cauldron. You draw the warm air in through your nose and the smell makes your mouth start watering. The goulash is bubbling in the cauldron. You draw the warm air. The goulash. Do you know what Lord Yonan wants? The maid gives you an amused look. She has often accused you of making things more complicated than necessary. Do you know what Lord Yonan wants? The maid gives you an amused look. Do you know what lo the maid? Hey, what are you doing, groundling? We're still eating here. Why don't you go and get your own portion? The blacksmith. Do you want something? Did a horse bolt while you were trying to shoe it? It's certainly not on our plates. Of the 200 or so people selected to learn the art of magic under Lot Yonan, there's barely a handful of them you can stand the sight of. You're not at all interested in magic in all its elusiveness and whimsy. Your realm is the Forge. A map of Girdlegard. The kingdoms of the humans are marked, but the map maker's focus was the magic realms of the Magi. Yonandar, Brandokai, Leos Nudin, Oromyra, Saborian and Tuguria. While most of the landscape features are missing, the veins of the magic fields are marked in painstaking precision. Five veins spread out under Girdlegard, beginning at Leos Nudin in the middle. A map of Girdlegard, while most of the... I should speak to Lord Yonan first. He doesn't like to be kept waiting. You mumble and wonder when you started speaking thoughts like this out loud.
Lot Yonan didn't just take you in. He also taught you how to read and write. But you don't feel like reading right now. Especially as you already know all the books by heart. Master Lot Yonan, Frala told me you wished to speak with me. Ah, Tungdil, come in. Uh, there is a bag over there in the cupboard. Take it out, please. It contains artifacts belonging to my former Famulus Goren. I wish to return them to him. He's in Black Saddle, 300 miles away. 300 miles? That's a long journey. Who are you going to entrust with this? I was thinking of you. Me? There is no one better to take on this journey. You have acquired much knowledge. You are almost a scholar. You know more than most family about Girdlegard and its inhabitants. It is time for you to go out into the world and see it with your own eyes. I... with pleasure. What's in the bag? Magical devices. Uh, you better leave the bag closed if you want to avoid any accidents. Dwarves don't really like magic, and magic doesn't like you either. Rakus gave us so much craftsmanship that there's no space left in our bodies for magic. Strictly speaking, every time you've been too close to magic, it has ended in catastrophe. Perhaps I'll meet some dwarves on my travels. Yes, perhaps. But don't hold out too much hope. And be careful who you talk to. Not everyone out there likes dwarves. Yeah, goblins. They abduct baby dwarves and sell them to magi, from what I've heard. Not the best bit of business I've ever done. But what was I to do? The long noses threatened to throw you into the nearest river. Be on your guard. Look after the bag and don't lose it. May Palandiel be with you. And Varakas too, of course. I'll set off immediately. I'll see you soon, Lot Yonan. Within a few moments you find Black Saddle on the map. It is southeast of Parista, a little more than halfway between the city of the Magus Nudin and Lot Yonan's vaults. You trace the path from the vaults to the mountain with your finger. It doesn't seem far on the map, but it will be the biggest journey of your life. You're about to dive headlong into your adventure, but then stop yourself. A journey over 300 miles without provisions and a weapon? I shouldn't forget to think in all my excitement. You know you're not a good fighter. You've only ever used an axe for chopping wood. 
but the good steel gives you a certain feeling of safety nonetheless. I wonder if dwarves ask Vrakus for help on long journeys. The figure on the homemade altar doesn't answer. If I hurry, I might be back in time for Sonia's birthday. You're longing to see her face when you give her your homemade present. It would be better to leave Lot Yonan to his work for now. You've already been given an assignment and you should leave as soon as possible. After all, you don't want him thinking you're homesick before you've even left. Just as you reach the door, your stomach rumbles. It's not even noon yet, and you think you're going to survive a 300-mile journey without provisions? The goulash is bubbling. Hello, Frala. Hmm? I need provisions for 300 miles. You're grinning from ear to ear. Finally, you've got the chance to see something of the world. 300? Tungdal, that's no errand. That's an epic journey. Wait, I've got just the right thing. But make sure the cook doesn't see. I'm going to Black Saddle to return a few things to a former apprentice in the Magus. You pocket the rye bread, sausages and ham. Enough food for the first few days of your journey. Perhaps I'll even meet some dwarves on the way. Frala throws you a cautious glance. It's a tricky subject that you can't help but broach. There aren't dwarves down here. You're the only one in Idda's Lane as far as we know. I know, but... I can't just have been born out of a rock. Somewhere in the mountains, I have a clan. Maybe even a family. Yes. Maybe. Frala has reminded you more than once that Lot Yonan wrote to the dwarf clans and none of them were missing a dwarf boy. I've got a present for you. You take out a symbol of protection that you've carefully made from three horseshoe nails. It's not the finest jewellery in Girdlegard. One look at Frala's face makes it clear that it doesn't matter. She glows with happiness as she takes the pendant. For me? But why? Because you don't see me as an oddity and you're like a little sister to me. You could have said. But you settle with a shrug and a crooked smile. I have to go. I've got a long journey ahead of me. I wish you the blessing of Palandiel and Vrakas to protect you from all danger on your journey. Here, a talisman. Whenever you look at it, think of me. Frala winks at you mischievously. And of getting me a nice present.
How nice to see you again, Lot Yonan. It must have been an age since we last met face to face. Nudin, welcome. Please, sit down. No, thank you, my friend. These are urgent matters, and I don't have much time. You must come to Leos Nudin immediately. The perished land is stirring. Are you sure? What makes you think that? I found out about sixty orbits ago, during a visit to the borders. Our magical barriers have weakened and become porous. The Elfa have left their land, and a huge horde of orcs have marched into Girdelgard. Were you able to strengthen the spell with your magic? No. I can't repair the damage alone. We need the combined power of the Six. The other four are already on their way here, but we need your help too. I will set off for Parista without delay. Oh, and um, as you're coming, could you also take the opportunity to bring back the things that I lent to you? Of course. I have them already packed in a bag. Oh, thank you. We'll be expecting you. Utterly blinded by the sunlight, you squeeze your eyes tightly shut after only a few steps. The time spent underground has made you so sensitive to light that you're forced to seek shelter in the shade of a mighty oak. You reach a small lake by a birchwood. Your feet hurt and your eyes still sting in the unaccustomed sunlight. But a smile spreads across your face nonetheless. You've covered a decent distance on the first day of your big journey. You pitch your camp and lie down to sleep on the hard forest floor. When you awake in the morning, your legs are stiff and achy. Trying not to feel sorry for yourself, you throw your rucksack over your shoulder. You're a dwarf and dwarves don't complain. You can see the familiar entranceway to the underground vaults, but you don't enter. What would I tell Lot Yonan? I haven't been to Black Saddle yet and I've seen next to nothing. I should get out of here before Jollison or one of the other famuli sees me and accuses me of being homesick. You turn on your heels. Around midday, 
with the sun high in the sky and the first beads of sweat appearing on your forehead, you see something move next to the road a few hundred meters ahead. Some crows are pecking at something in the long grass. You survey the grass, the bushes and the few trees that are growing on both sides of the track. The wind blows through the grass and the leaves tremble. The pecking of the birds is only interrupted by the occasional fluttering of their wings. Apart from that, you see nothing. The creaking leather armor, the clattering rucksack, and a dwarf's inability to be quiet makes the crows flap around as you move from one bush to another. You give up trying to be stealthy, stand up straight, and see two human bodies in the flattened grass. You don't see any signs of a struggle in the area where the corpses are lying. Were they stabbed by a companion? A stranger could hardly have crept up on them with such sparse cover. A slender man lies in front of you, dressed in an expensive robe. It is in the colors of Turgur the Fair-Faced, one of the six Magi. The dead man must be one of Turgur's famuli. You don't see any wounds. By Vrakus. There are some narrow stab wounds in the man's chest. The cuts are too big to have been made by arrows, but too small for sword wounds. Nothing. You look down on a tall, broadly built man. He's wearing dark brown leather armor, but is strengthened with iron plates. There's a sword lying next to him. Was he trying to defend himself against something? Or someone? There is no blood on the sword. The man has the same incisions. It's clear that both men were killed by the same weapon. But what that weapon might be, you cannot say. A rucksack that probably belonged to one of the dead. It seems to have been searched and then thrown away carelessly. You find a few implements, some provisions, and a map. A route is drawn on it from Perista, Nudin's capital, to Lot Yonan's vaults. Does this mean that Turga the Fair-Faced is in Perista and wanted to send Lot Yonan a message? And if so, why didn't he use magic? Did he want to contact him without anyone noticing? Why all this secrecy? Nothing again. You halt. There is something. Another rucksack. You open the rucksack and recognize that someone has already rummaged through it. As well as some implements and writing utensils, you find a pouch full of gold and a talisman. The gold is proof that this is not a case of robbery. Warmth and a feeling of security flush through your body as you touch the talisman. 
You feel safer just holding it in your hand. I'm taking you with me. You scour the area once more and ask yourself what to do next. It's time consuming and strenuous work digging shallow graves in the ground with a stick and covering the corpses with a few stones but it should at least keep the crows from their feasting for a while. You continue on your way so as to put a few more miles between you and your grisly find before night falls. As the gable end of a small farmhouse and a barn appear from behind a hilltop, you hear the loud cries of children at play. A girl runs along the path laughing, followed by a small boy with a big stick in his hand. The boy is trying to catch up his sister with a determined look on his face, but is finding it difficult to keep his short legs under control on the uneven path. The boy trips and falls to the ground with a bump. Before the girl can reach him to help, he picks himself up and grabs the stick to continue the chase. In doing so, he catches a glimpse of you and his eyes grow wide. All he manages to say is, there, as he points towards you with a chubby little finger. Now the girl has turned to face you too. Before you can say a word, she lifts her little brother up into her arms and runs screaming towards the farmhouse. Without rushing, you follow the children to the farmhouse into which they've disappeared. After a few moments, they reappear, accompanied by their parents. Their father is a thick-set man with grey hair. I am Apache. This is my wife, Remsa. The blonde woman nods a greeting almost imperceptibly and clasps her daughter tightly to her. She looks you over with an anxious expression. It's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Tundal. You try to make your voice sound as harmless as possible. Over the last few days have you seen two travellers heading east? Opatia looks at his wife. But she shakes her head. Why do you ask? I found them. Two dead bodies on the side of the road. A good day's march east from here. Dead bodies? She hastily covers her son's ears. Was it orcs? Remsa, what would orcs be doing up here? It was probably just bandits. I'm sorry if I scared your wife and children. The man waves dismissively. No, no. It's just that my fair woman is especially jumpy these days. The orcs have been spotted near Calmstead. You should take it more seriously. The farmer's wife clutches her daughter even tighter before the girl finally protests. The boy steps forward excitedly and cuts the air with his stick. If strangers come, we're supposed to run away, but I can hit them too. Opatia pats his son on the head, laughing. We're safe. The Orcs have no reason to come so far north.
Wouldn't it be better to move to one of the bigger villages if there are orcs around? The farm is our livelihood. We can't just leave the place. The fields don't look after themselves. King Tilagorn's cavalry will take care of the orcs, or Lord Yonan and his magi. But the cavalry can't be everywhere at once. Even a handful of orcs would be enough to finish us. Hmm. Once the seeds are planted, I'll build the hideaway, just as you wish. But what use is a hideaway if we've nothing to eat in the autumn? If there are orcs in the area, then you shouldn't waste any time. Build that hideaway. The dwarf is right. Remser gives you a thankful smile before turning to her husband. We'll take care of the other problems when we come to them. The most important thing is that we're safe. Opatia stays silent for a moment, a gloomy expression on his face before shrugging his shoulders. All right then, dwarves do know best when it comes to orcs. You bid farewell and set off on your way. The children follow you for a while before saying their goodbyes in laughter and running back towards the farm. You see a flickering light through the trees some way from the path. It might come from a campfire. You creep through the undergrowth towards the fire, but can't prevent your armour from clattering and small twigs from breaking under every heavy step you take. You curse quietly to yourself, but go on until you can see what's going on. Three broad-shouldered men with axes sit at a campfire, on which two rabbits are sizzling. It's only thanks to the fact that the men are joking loudly with one another, and not paying attention to their surroundings, that they haven't discovered you yet. You sneak up on the men, until a thick branch breaks loudly under your boot. You realize, terrified, that the men's voices have fallen silent. The men jump up and grab their axes. Who's there? You stay silent, but the men have already become suspicious. There's something there. All three peer into the darkness, and although they haven't seen you, they eventually begin to move in your direction, with axes raised. You turn around to take flight. That moment, another man steps out of the shadows and aims his axe at you. You recoil alarmed. You step into the light of the fire, your hands raised in a conciliatory gesture. My name is Tungdil, I'm only... Well, I'll be. Is that a groundling? The men look you over suspiciously. What's a groundling doing creeping around here? Are you after our gold? I bet he was hoping to slit our throats once we fell asleep, subterranean scum! Your heart is pounding, and you confront the man a little more courageously than you feel. I'm no thief, and I'm certainly no murderer. I only wanted to see if... 